Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'm going to be addressing humane education and alternatives in education and training. So we're going to be looking at the range of different tools and approaches that can fully replace harmful animal use in the life sciences. So veterinary medicine, medicine and biological science. And um, uh, I'm going to start off with a, a taste of some alternatives and then look at the, a little about the history of interniche. Um, and then look at some of the background um, before we look at the different types of alternatives. After that, we'll be looking at some of the resources that are available, some of the arguments, um, the further arguments of their pedagogical benefits, um, before making some suggestions on what everyone can do to feed into this growing movement for um, a fully ethical and a highly effective education. So, a quick taste of some alternatives. Um, this is a virtual laboratory for muscle physiology courses. So when students of medicine and veterinary medicine and biology are learning about physiology, they, um, they may well face um, an experiment where a, um, a frog muscle is, is taken from a freshly killed frog and uh, used in order to illustrate the principles of muscle physiology. There's also nerve physiology in other areas where other, other practical classes where... Um, uh, the classical animal experimentation or, or preparation is done. Um, but this is a software that can directly replace that um, practical class. Um, it's called SimMuscle, and you can, you can change uh, all the different parameters to do an experiment just as you would do um, with, a, with a real animal. And it teaches you the, um, the principles of muscle physiology. This is the Sindava canine. It's a, a, a very new synthetic dog where you can learn anatomy and also practice a wide range of clinical skills and surgery, surgical procedures, just as any vet would need to know. Um, but this tool is really effective in terms of helping with, with skills acquisition. So this is another very new model. And then there's work in the clinic. So work with animal patients, students helping um, with, with specific minor procedures under supervision once they've learned on non-animal methods like models and mannequins. So this is another alternative because it's an alternative to um, the use of animals in surgical training. But you're still working with a real animal. Okay, so Internish was founded back in 1988 by students who conscientiously objected to the harmful animal use in their classes and anti-vivisection campaigners and animal welfare researchers. We're a small non-for-profit organization um, with a global network, and we have national contacts and partners in many different countries, and other people we work with as well. We're largely volunteer-based, and um, we, we produce a lot of information resources, we promote alternatives, uh, we do outreach tours across the world, and, um, and try to achieve and manage to achieve direct replacement of the harmful animal use. So we try to have an inclusive practice and an, an inclusive message. Um, the activity with our contacts ranges from Brazil and Germany to Ukraine, Iran, India. So um, this is where we've got people working. This is where um, we may have outreach visits. This is where activity is done um, by, by the contacts, by me and by um, other people we collaborate with. So we work with students and teachers and campaigners at the grassroots, but we've also got connections and um, able to work at sort of higher levels or more centers of power like... Uh, trying to get new legislation um, adopted or, or having talks at meetings at the European Parliament, for example. So uh, we try to sort of work at all, all levels to be able to sort of uh, uh, connect up with um, people who might be able to make a difference um, in, in, our in our field. So we, we try to do things in a collaborative way, very much focus on solutions. Um, so we, we very much promote the alternatives and, and try to argue the case that these are superior to harmful animal use, and we find that way can often open more doors. Um, so we're willing to look for and find common ground with anyone who who's, uh, um, has an interest in, in replacement, replacement of harmful animal use, and try to keep focusing on someone's practice rather than criticizing them as a person. So they have the potential to change and they feel valued and validated as an individual, um, even if we're, we're to disagree with their actual practice. And I think that makes our approach more inclusive and also gives more opportunities to uh, develop networks and, and try to get collaborative change. So 
we got quite diverse networks and demogra demographics. So this week, um, it's been a bit of a busy week. So I was in Switzerland for a National Scientific Alternatives Conference. Uh, then in Ethiopia at a Pan-African and UN Animal Welfare and Sustainability Conference. And uh, now here in Luxembourg. So um, every now and then it becomes a really busy time with a lot of activity. Um, and at different times, we might be working more on resources like production of a film um, and a book that we're doing. Um, where I'm, I'm based at home, in a home office. So, in terms of this field, we're not talking about research, which is the, um, the finding of new knowledge. We're not talking about testing of drugs and chemicals, um, for example, for regulatory purposes. Um, but we're talking about humane education, and that does feed into a humane science, into humane research, into humane testing. But there, there are some differences between these fields, and sometimes it's very useful to be clear um, of those differences as well as the, the connections between them. So we focus on education training at secondary, university, and professional level, but primarily university level where students are, are learning those life science degrees. Um, so medical, veterinary, and biology. And the topic of, of harmful animal use refers to the practical classes within these disciplines. So anatomy, learning the structure of animal and human bodies, um, pathology, physiology, pharmacology, clinical skills and surgery. So these are the areas where the, the harmful animal use uh, sometimes occurs. So our focus is replacement, full replacement of harmful animal use within education and training. So students are using the alternatives in order to learn. We're not talking about learning about alternatives, we're talking about learning through alternatives, learning by alternatives. So it's a pedagogical issue, effective acquisition of knowledge and skills and attitudes by students and trainees. Um, so it's very much about the design of the curriculum, which tools and which approaches are used, are they humane tools, are they good tools, um, um, in order to design the practical class that students will be participating in. Now, the majority of conventional harmful animal, uh, animal use in education has been harmful. There's a lot of really good changes happening at the moment, which I'll talk about um, shortly. But the majority has been harmful. And this includes dissection of purpose-killed animals, animal experimentation itself, and other instrumental animal use that doesn't, doesn't fit into those two categories. So these are the three areas where animals might be used harmfully. Now, sometimes you'll come across this this myth that uh, animal experimentation is, is the real thing and that alternatives are not, that there's some mediocre approximation to the real thing. Um, but this isn't, this isn't true. In fact, it confuses the method with the objective within education. Animal experimentation is just one method. Uh, the real thing is actually how effectively the students gain knowledge and skills and positive attitudes. So this is like a paradigm shift, and a lot of teachers will be thinking of animal experiments as the way they've always done it, dissections as the way they've always done it. But in fact, um, it's better to look at what you're really trying to achieve in terms of teaching objectives and then finding humane ways and being informed about the, the diversity of um, tools and approaches that are already developed and already implemented in many universities. So it's important, I think, sometimes to go deep and look at the, the myths and identify the paradigm in order to uh, subvert the myth and, um, and change paradigm. So what are alternatives? Um, they're educational aids or they're teaching approaches that can replace harmful animal use and meet teaching objectives. And it's very important to be looking at the quality of education, the teaching objectives if you're going to have a conversation with a teacher or with students, because that's what education is about or is meant to be about. We also, of course, need to define harm. If we're talking about replacement of harmful animal use, uh, some people say a, a quick death doesn't involve any harm, so what's the problem with dissection? But um, we uh, disagree with that. So our definition of harm is also including any action that limits uh, an animal's freedom to live. So killing is a form of harm, no matter how quickly or humanely it's done. Um, and freedom to express full natural behavior, as well as the typical, most obvious freedom of freedom from pain, injury, um, and disease. So our definition of, of harm is uh, detailed in our policy, um, and this will impact on, on 
of the arguments we use with teachers, of the discussions we have with teachers in terms of what could be a better approach. Um, there's many different animal welfare, animal rights, and environmental problems of harmful animal use, ranging from the capture, which might involve endangered animals or wild animals, the breeding, the selling, the transportation, the keeping of the animal, the preparation, the killing, the experimentation, and the disposal. And all of these, of course, have a negative impact in terms of the animals, but also environmentally. Now, if you've come across work with alternatives to animal experiments in any field, education and training, or research or testing, you might have come across the three R's. This is replacement, reduction, and refinement of animal experimentation. This was now is the 60th anniversary since Russell and Birch published their, um, their booklet on humane experimental technique. Um, and um, the challenge is that this has come from a laboratory animal science background, and it's not really a pedagogical issue. Um, and also it doesn't really look at some of the latest developments. So for education and training, we argue that full replacement is possible. So one R, not three R's. Um, and also that we can extend the definition of alternatives to include uh, work with animals that is neutral or, or be beneficial to those individual animals. So we, we try to redefine the three R's for when it comes to, or redefine the definition of alternatives for when it comes to education and training. Sometimes teachers, veterinary teachers, are, are bringing in animal welfare courses, but if students are learning this and also involved in harmful animal use at the same time, then, of course, that's really inconsistent. So we argue um, that animal welfare um, should be taught along with um, um, the, the alternatives being fully implemented and having achieved full replacement. So what are the different tools and approaches? We're going to look at the, the, the range of... Um, uh, of different tools and approaches now, and I've also got some, some demonstrations, just brief demonstrations of some, some software. So there's not, uh, sorry, we've got non-animal tools, um, and then humane approaches, as I mentioned, that um, can actually help individual animals. So those are the two areas. There's film and video, models and mannequins and simulators, computer simulation and virtual reality, what we would call, and how we define, ethically sourced animal cadavers and tissue, for example, for veterinary students. Clinical work with animal patients and animal volunteers. Student self-experimentation. In vitro labs, meaning in a test tube or a Petri dish. And ethical field studies. So this is where we promote such tools and approaches. Um, and, uh, and sometimes individual or individual alternatives can do the job of replacement. Other times, a combination might be suitable. So if we look at film and video first, just briefly, this is a stills image from a, a professionally performed dissection of a, um, of a bird. Um, and of course, because it's professionally performed, it's, it's well done, and, uh, which is not what's going to happen if a student did that dissection of a purpose-killed animal. And also, because it's software, it's a digital film, it can be used forever, that one, that one disc networked. So there's no... Um, there's no further need for work for any animals to be killed for its production, um, although it could have been made with a, um, an ethically sourced cadaver as well, which I'll define shortly. So film and video is very flexible. It's not hands-on, and some students need that skill, but we'll look at how hands-on skills can be met um, shortly. But digital video can bring about direct replacement for some practical classes. Then we have models and mannequins and simulators. Models have been used for hundreds of years, of course, to illustrate anatomy. Here's a, a very old model of a horse made of wood, um, and there's also lots of plastic models too. Um, this is students who are building up the musculature of a horse. So they're sort of creating the horse by looking at how the muscles um, uh, attach to the, uh, to the skeleton and, um, and the, the, the different orientation of the muscles and how they relate to each other, their spatial arrangement. So that's quite nice because it's actually building up um, the, the model from clay um, rather than just taking things apart. But both, both approaches can be, can be valuable. There's also the growth of 3D printing. So on the Interniche stall just out here, um, we have three or four 3D printed bones. This, of course, allows for sort of local production of alternatives internationally um, and also can be very, very low cost once the initial purchase of the 3D printer has been made. So 3D printing both for bones and for soft tissue. And then there's also 
3D bioprinting as well, um, can also help bring about some replacement. This is a, um, a suture pad. Um, so a multiple layer suture pad for students to practice the beginnings of clinical skills and surgery um, techniques. And in this case, it actually has um, some synthetic blood within it. So you can, man you can make an incision, have the, the pad bleeding, and then as a student, you can work on, on, uh, um, on tying off that vessel. And that's, a, that's something that all students will need to do, all veterinary students and medical students, will need to do within their careers. So these are, these are crucial skills. What models like this provide is a chance for students to practice and practice and practice again until they've got the confidence and the competence to go on to the next stage. Um, for example, a more complex model, different levels of fidelity or levels of realism um, can be built into the design of the curriculum. Sometimes a very simple model is the best approach. No distractions, um, a focus on just one skill. Other times, something much more complex, multiple layers linked up to a mannequin, um, and so on is, is a better way. So it all depends on the level of the education. This is, um, oops, okay. This is a, um, uh, a suture pad from above. This is what the, the trainee will see. This is a rabbit ear, so you can practice taking injections and giving injections and taking blood. Some of these alternatives were developed for laboratory animal training. Um, we still promote them because if you can get replacement even within laboratory animal training, then that replacement has been achieved. You've also exposed those future animal researchers, those future animal technicians to alternatives. They'll be more open-minded. They'll, um, they'll be aware of the range of alternatives that exist. And who knows, maybe they'll actually choose a different career. Um, but we don't focus on research and testing. We focus on education and training, although we're perfectly aware of the links between those fields and others. So there are some ethical issues here in terms of uh, training people who will go on to harm animals, um, but it's the best we can do within that field. Um, and certainly some of these models can also be used for clinical training, which is of course what we would prefer that students went into working in the clinic with patients or doing humane research and testing. This is a spay and neuter mannequin. So this is for students to be able to practice the techniques of spaying and neutering before they work on the real animal. So they can keep on practicing, they can make their mistakes before they work with a real animal. And, um, and that's really important. So you've got a replacement to catching animals and doing spays and neuters. So I was in, as you saw, I was in Ethiopia recently and a few days ago and there was a Kenyan student and they were saying that dogs are caught from the market, sold for $3, three to, to a university, and students then practice a whole range of different techniques, including spaying and neutering. They don't know what they're doing because they haven't had a range of good tools before that. And then the animals, injured and not well spayed or neutered, are then, are then euthanized, are then killed, in fact, uh, rather than recovered. Um, so uh, as well as all the animal problems, you've also got a really bad learning lesson there for students. A model like this, you can practice and practice again, keep repeating until you and the teacher believes they're ready, you're ready to go on to the next level of education. And this is an important thing for whatever field of animal protection you're working in, especially if you've got a shelter or you're working as a teacher, um, you need to have people who've got sufficient skills to work with, with animals. So the veterinary profession is very interesting in the sense that um, people are very close to animals, but there's also that closeness can work two ways. It can work with really excellent healing, or it can actually be an opportunity for um, for harmful animal use and for exploiting animals. So um, we're talking not just about veterinary, also medical and biology, but um, I've got a fair few slides of, of, about this field now. This is Jerry, the dog, not the guy. And Jerry is also outside, um, or maybe Jerry's brother. And Jerry is a, is a mannequin where you've got a whole range of different functionalities that you can learn um, as a student. So you are, you're able to learn how to approach the dog successfully, um, and safely. Um, uh, it can be used, of course, for, tr for training people in sort of rabies protection work and, um, and uh, encouraging people to respect dogs more, which is the, a necessary uh, thing in some countries. Um, but also it can be learned, it can be used for, for veterinary training. So you can practice intubation, putting a tube down the throat, which is something you need to do as a vet sometimes. And you, when you're using the mannequin, you won't be causing any injury or stress to the animal. Um, which often happens if five students are going to be working with an animal um, in a practical class in an, with an animal 
experiment or other instrumental animal use, we should say. So when you're using the mannequin, no harm, also no stress or no problems for the student either. Um, you can also connect up Jerry to other equipment um, and do more. Um, Jerry, with Jerry's neck and forelimb, you can take blood and give injections. Um, you've got a broken bone in the leg with different types of fracture, synthetic bone, and you can learn how to practice that in a, in a simulated clinical situation. Um, and you've also got breath and heart sounds. And if you haven't listened to Jerry's breath and heart sounds, I recommend uh, doing that um, right after the talk. And, um, and that's really good in terms of being able to hear the sounds of different pathologies. And in fact, that aspect doesn't really replace any harmful animal use, but it does show the, the power of a good model to support the learning process. And I know professional vets who said, I wish I had that in my course. I wish I had that now in my clinic because it can really help you to diagnose a problem with an animal and then to um, help um, the animal recover. This is the Sindhava dog again. This is like, I, I think from the 90s, we had a, the beginning of a revolution with um, uh, technological developments and computer science, um, which really helped create some of the digital anatomy programs, the, um, the virtual laboratories and so on. And, uh, I think now we're on the cusp of a new revolution with materials technology in terms of the most amazing tissue that is almost exactly the same as real human or animal tissue. And this model, and I was filming at the company in, in Florida, it's a biotech company that makes this model and lots of models for, for people as well, um, is absolutely stunning. Um, it's really, really impressive. I'm going to show a clip of that um, shortly. I need to go to the folder for that. Um, so at the end of this, sec this section, I'll, I'll, I'll do a couple of demos and uh, show you the clips. This is the inside of the dog. You can see there's a whole range of different organs, all like highly realistic. Um, and this is actually better than a, an animal cadaver. You can actually learn better on this synthetic cadaver. And these cadavers um, can last decades. They can last a really, really long time. So although their initial cost is quite a lot, um, they can become cost effective over time. Oops. The Sindhava Surgical okay. Canine is the most advanced, hands-on surgical simulator on the market today. Based on technology originally developed for training in human medicine, the canine was developed in conjunction with the University of Florida College of Veterinary Medicine and provides students with an unparalleled surgical training scenario without risk to live animals. Sindhava has been developing lifelike surgical trainers for decades and has devoted much of its efforts to the development of a proprietary synthetic tissue that mimics living tissue in terms of its physical and mechanical properties. Sin tissue is made of water, salts, and fibers, very much like natural living tissue. The synthetic canine tissue is actually a culmination of millions of man hours of development. Each organ, tissue, and system has been independently developed and designed for performance and realism. Even the physical resistance to incision and suturing is lifelike. Each canine surgical trainer is handmade. Assembly begins with the skeletal system and continues with musculature, the circulatory system, the pulmonary system, the digestive and reproductive organs, as well as skin. The canine is designed to breathe through intubation and bleed with perfused organs, taking into account the needs of surgical educators and procedures common to canine surgical curriculum the Sindhava Surgical Canine is designed to simulate 19 abdominal procedures and 16 additional technical procedures, making it the most versatile trainer on the market. Each procedure is performed on modular and interchangeable components that enable the procedures to be performed over and over again. All Sindhava synthetic tissues are stored in water and if properly maintained will last indefinitely. Additionally, each canine includes specific pathologies such as tumors, as well as common conditions such as foreign bodies causing digestive blockage and necrosis of surrounding tissue. Additional specific pathologies are available by special request. Sindhava provides educators with the highest quality hands-on learning tools on the market. For more information, contact us at sindhava.com. Okay, that was a, a promotional kit from the companies, you can tell. Um, but it does illustrate the, uh, uh, the model well. We also got our own footage of that. We showed it yesterday in the workshop and film showing. Um, but um, that will be part of the, the film we're working on in veterinary education and training. So it's really a lot of potential with, with some, some of the new technology. Um, 
And of course, many universities already have a skills lab, a clinical skills lab, with models like this, and smaller models, bigger models, different types of models. Um, this is one from um, Illinois, veterinary curriculum. So they have their clinical skills lab. And students can come in and out and can keep on practicing. And this is a really good approach. OK, then we have multimedia computer simulation. Um, here you have a virtual anatomy program. You have many different boxes and areas in order to um, read more information or look at histology. Um, and also you can sort of open up the animal. So this is like a simulated online or simulated uh, digital dissection. Um, this here is the virtual canine anatomy, which is based on photographs of a dog that had to be put down in the clinic. And um, uh, I'll be showing you that, uh, some of that shortly. So uh, this, again, is a program with a lot of information in it. And um, uh, when I do the demo, if we have time, I'll, um, you'll be able to see how powerful some of the software um, actually is. This is the virtual laboratory, I told you. Very good for physiology and pharmacology, because you, with those, you have the, the need to correlate multiple and simultaneous events and look at change over time. So multimedia is really good for um, having different parameters, having a printout, looking at the effects of drugs or, um, or electrical stimulation on, on, uh, on organs or tissue. So this can bring about direct replacement as well. Um, this is an animation of horse inter equine it internal anatomy. So um, with something like this, you can visualize structure more effectively. You can also look at a, a rectal exam, for example, to see how to do it properly when you're working with a real patient. Um, and um, again, it really helps with visualizing problems that arise within, uh, within different um, uh, conditions for different animals. This is an app for students to practice uh, um, a, a surgical technique before their exam or in between exams. So there's, there's some apps as well. Um, this is the haptic cow. Haptics is the simulation of the sense of touch. Now, you don't always need a simulation of a sense of touch um, in your... Um, in your model or your, or your software, in your virtual reality. Um, but sometimes it can be um, an extra um, uh, functionality within the, within the model. So the haptic cow, you can practice with the, there's a mannequin linked to the computer and students can practice how to do an internal exam correctly and keep on practicing. You can monitor how well they learn, monitor um, other criteria of their performance and then help ensure that people have all reached the same, the same level, skills level. Um, sometimes these alternatives also are flexible in terms of different people's entry points into a discipline. Um, and so, so they're very effective in terms of the learning process. In fact, I'd, I'd say that alternatives in general reflect a greater sensitivity to the learning process. So it's just smarter ways of designing courses with good tools. This is a, um, a stills image from a virtual reality clip. I'll be showing you that shortly as well. And there's a lot more virtual reality within medical training because there's more money and more risk of litigation if you go wrong. Um, but there's the beginning of um, virtual reality within veterinary medicine as well. Um, and uh, I've got a clip too of that. So this here is a, an image um, of trainees, students and trainees working with uh, virtual reality headset and controllers. We have a headset and controllers next door although we don't have a virtual reality program at the moment to demonstrate it. But at least you, you, I'll show you the clip from Colorado State University where you can see the development of their, their project in this. So here we are. Mm -hmm. Colorado State University builds one of the most widely recognized animal anatomy programs in the world. Virtual Animal Anatomy is the next generation of anatomy software. It offers photorealistic, interactive 3D models in a customized virtual reality environment. Virtual animal anatomy simplifies comparative anatomy by highlighting corresponding structures on multiple models of various species. In a cadaver dissection laboratory, delicate anatomical structures are easily damaged. In virtual animal anatomy, every interaction is with professionally dissected, high quality representative specimens. This immersive environment transforms learning helping students to visualize spatial relationships and key anatomical concepts. Customized resources facilitate teaching efficacy, enabling students to integrate knowledge while becoming adaptable, lifelong learners. Okay, so that's a, quite an exciting development in terms of 
the use of technology, which is also exciting for students, so that, that sort of helps with the learning process, things that are exciting, things that are fun, um, can also sort of provide a better learning environment. Okay, um, so I'm going to try and show you a couple of software clips now, if we have, uh, uh, if we're okay for this. I won't show you Virtual Canine Anatomy, the 2D program, um, now, because we've, um, uh, you've seen the virtual reality, but the 2D program is just similar with labeling multiple levels of um, uh, multiple views, the head, the neck, the torso, uh, and then dissection, superficial dissection, deep dissection, and then 15 or so layers of that dissection with all the labeling and hyperlinks and descriptions um, that's there as well. So um, because of time, I won't show you that now, but we'll have a look at the glass horse equine colic. So for example, if we look at uh, diseases, we then have, out of these options, then we have um, different organs. We can look at cecum, for example, obstruction, distension, and strangulation obstruction. If we look at the latter, then we have one condition called cecocolic intersusception. And this is a little bit more advanced veterinary training. There are also softwares for the, the distal limb of the horse, which is more for students. But if we look at that, then we have a chance to look at the disease movie that tells you how that disease, that condition, arose. So you're better prepared for when you... Uh, come across this disease in a real horse, in a real animal patient? Mm -hmm. Cecal colic intussusception is a very uncommon cause of colic in horses and has been associated with inflammation of the mucosa caused by tapeworm infection. This condition is manifested by invagination of the cecum into the lumen of the right ventral colon. Okay, now if you really need animals or animal tissue, how do you get that in a fully ethical way? Um, we argue that body donation programs are a solution, just like human body donation programs. So when an animal dies naturally or in an accident or has to be euthanized for medical reasons um, and it was free living, we would call that ethically sourced. Okay, um, if it wasn't free living, like a sheep, but still died in the same way, then we would call that an acceptable other source. So this is how we define it in our policy, to try to push for fully ethical sourcing only. Um, you can also preserve animals that you've got through a body donation program, plastination, other preservation methods. Um, this here is a, a laparoscopic trainer, so minimally invasive surgery, and such tissue can be used within it, although this company is now going to be using 3D printed tissue from next year. So there's some really good developments within that, um, within that field. Um, you can also perfuse a human head. This is a photograph of someone practicing neurosurgery in medicine um, with a perfusion of colored water going through and a, pulp, a pump for pulsation. So you basically animate a cadaver. You create a, a living cadaver. And that, again, can be a replacement for animal experiments. You can do work with animal patients under supervision after you've worked on all the mannequins first for your skills acquisition and after you've got all the knowledge that feeds into that too. And um, that's really important because it's case-based, so it's experiential. It's based on cases of patients rather than an experiment. Lots of opportunities with um, clinics and spaying, spaying you to work and getting out, um, in, in, some, in more some more in some countries than others. And that also pushes for caring as a clinical skill. Often that's completely forgotten about or completely negated. But in fact, if you care, you're going to be following up on the information, you're going to make sure your operation's done as well as possible, post-operative recovery um, is going to be done better. So caring is actually a cl clinical skill. You could put chalk, colored chalk on a, on a horse and watch it uh, with its musculature and its bones and watch it move, him or her move. And um, that's a, a sort of living anatomy program rather than just focusing on killing for dissection um, for anatomy purposes. So uh, this is another option. Um, we define volunteers in our policy. I won't uh, go into the details now, but basically the animal is more or less in control, well, is in control of whether the, the practical class would stop or not. You can do experiments on yourself. So software plus self-experimentation is really good for physiology. You can work in vitro, and the, the fields of research and testing, uh, alternatives within those fields are growing fast. So the more that students are familiar with this, um, the more we're likely to open up doors to the, the growth of humane research and testing as well. And you can do ethical field studies, getting out of the lab, into the field, observing wild animals, ethical studies, 
um, and also learn contribute to conservation, understand uh, a bit more of the ecology, and that can be really valuable as well. So these are the range of different alternatives. Um, you can better meet standing um, standard teaching objectives with alternatives, um, and the published studies demonstrate that too. You can also um, avoid the hidden curriculum, the implicit negative messages um, that, um, that a certain learning tool can, uh, can offer. So that's uh, when you use alternatives, you obviate, you remove that problem. All the, the desensitization, the teaching that animals can be used as objects. Those are the, the, the implicit messages that a tool might uh, give to students. And alternatives also connect you with biology as the study of life, medicine and veterinary medicine as a healing, not a harming um, approach. And also it encourages critical thinking skills. Compassion and empathy and respect for life and responsibility can be nurtured with alternatives rather than damaged with harmful animal use. And um, as doctors, people will be, will be making ethical decisions all the time. So the more that ethical, ethical issues are, are not swept under the carpet, are brought out and resolved, the better that, um, that is in terms of training. And also, if, if students are thinking of not even going into medicine or veterinary medicine or biology because of the dissection of killed animals and animal experiments, then that's a question of accessibility um, and inclusivity. So if you have alternatives, you open the doors for more people who might be cri critical thinkers, challenging, this, challenging the, uh, the orthodoxy, uh, who might care rather than not care. Um, and so humane education is, is more effective in many different ways. And finally, students who are coerced into leaving their course or, um, or dropping out um, or being bullied by, by, um, by teachers, they uh, have a, a, an issue there. They have a, um, a question of civil liberties and, and, and freedom of conscience, which should, should be protected. So it's also a question of animal freedom, of course. Are the animals being used harmfully or at all? And if the environmental impact is usually better with alternatives. Um, when students learn better, keep the compassion, are more critical thinkers, that's going to affect the professions and society as a whole. Um, and of course, emotional and ethical literacy are very important for us all as individuals too. We don't want to be losing those skills. They're really important for ourselves and for social cohesion. And economically, while some alternatives cost more, many are low cost or free, and you have the opportunity to develop alternatives locally. So there's potential for economic development, local economic development as well. And legislation usually says that alternatives should be used wherever possible. So we offer resources, uh, a website with, a, with databases on alternatives, libraries of alternatives, sometimes small grants and free software, and we support students who conscientiously object. We also do outreach tours and conferences and training. There's Lots of other information and resources available. For example, students can download and work with this software for free. And it's really good, uh, really good physiology software. You can make your own alternatives. And it's good to think across disciplines, like involving the anatomy or physiology teacher with the computer scientist and the graphic designer. And together, that can work really well. And don't forget, there's also support from larger, larger degrees of support from other bodies, like the Lush Prize, which will be launched tomorrow. And over £2 million has been distributed so far since 2012. And that's a reward for um, uh, replacement that's already been achieved. So you can promote that within your country to the teachers, um, and they can get rewarded for, um, for, for, for projects they've already done. So I think in terms of our successes, um, we've built up a good network. We're fully internationalist. We try to be more accessible, have a holistic um, approach, but stay focused on this topic. I think we've got really good arguments for full replacement. We produce some good resources that can support teachers and students. And in terms of direct replacement, um, we've, um, with our contacts in Ukraine and Russia, uh, we've been signing agreements with universities to fully replace their harmful animal use. And now over 50,000 animals are not being used annually. Um, uh, so every year, another 50,000 are not being used. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Um, and in India, zoology is now, zoology dissection has now been banned, and it's estimated, but there's no really good statistics available, that up to 60 million animals have been used annually, and something in that direction is now happening in terms of the replacement. So very wide-scale potential for, for, 
for replacement, especially when countries are quite centralized, like India. Once you get to the center, you can get change right across. But within um, some other countries, it's just the individual teacher who can help bring about some replacement. So I need to finish up very soon. So uh, just the last area. The regulations and laws in India, like I said, some changes have happened, and we've contributed to that. The, uh, um, the Ukraine, we've been more, more involved the, with India, um, we've been partly involved, contributing. Um, but in fact, there's new regulations in India, new regulations in Brazil that we contributed to um, that have led to um, a, a ban on some animal use in education. So that's, that's very, very widespread across the large country uh, of the, that is Brazil. And in Serbia, um, primary, secondary and tertiary level harmful animal use is banned. And that's partly, that was partly through our national contact for Serbia here, Katerina. And, um, and the, the, the article that defines the, um, the, uh, the ban is also based on the Indonesia policy. Okay, so in conclusion, um, alternatives are superior to harmful animal use. 100% replacement really is feasible and desirable. And once you know the arguments for this and identify the paradigms and the myths, you can get some good change. There's a diverse range of tools and approaches, and there's alternatives for every practical class. There's a growing momentum and success, I think, in this field, such that alternatives, the word alternatives, we maybe don't even need to use anymore. These are better learning tools. And that's, that's really exciting when we don't even need to use that word because people see that these are better. And finally, alternatives provide win-win solutions, multiple positive benefits for the students, the teachers, the professions, society, and the animals themselves. So it's part of a broader picture of sustainable development. And you can get involved with educating yourself about this issue, um, empowering yourself so you don't feel intimidated by teachers, for example. You know the basics to be able to engage with them. You know who else knows, knows something if you don't know it yourself. And that's really important. You might be able to get involved in some direct replacement work. Um, you might be able to help because you're in a certain country and be able to do some research work or identify some networks so we can work with you on that. So there's a lot of information and research work possible and information technology. You might be able to help programming some software. So thank you very much for listening. Any comments and questions, please? Yes, so I think we have time for one question. 